Hello again, Hope in the Word. I hope y'all are doing well. I had a good week. Have you been practicing your catchphrase from last week? God, I'm just as secure in the cave as I was in the palace because you alone make me dwell in safety. I've tried to make that a uh, kind of a word of truth for me this week as I keep coming back to that and it bolsters my soul uh, when I think of it. So I hope you all are doing well. Um, I was thinking this week that I would like to continue encouraging you and, um, you know, in light of 1 Peter, what kept jumping out at me from, from 1 Peter, if you recall from our study, was the way he kept reminding us to set our minds, prepare ourselves. And I think right now we need encouragement, but we also need to know how do we set our minds and how do we, we resist what Satan is trying to do? Because we certainly do see his oppression and his hand and all that's going on. So let's just uh, pray and um, kind of dive right in here, and I'd like to share my thoughts with you, okay? So let's open with prayer. Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you have a plan. Thank you, Lord, that this day and these days were well known of you before they ever came to be, that they had to pass through your fingers first to get to us, and when we know you are good and loving, that gives us the assurance that we need. Now, Lord, help me to communicate well the thoughts that you've put in my heart. Uh, give us all open hearts to receive what you have for us, that we can grow in you, uh, gain the encouragement we need from your word today for the current crisis that we're in. So, Father, I commit this teaching into your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, remember 1 Peter, and this is kind of what I was thinking, uh, some of these phrases. I'd like to title this teaching, The Power of Keeping Our Minds on Gospel Truth. We do have a part. Uh, God has given us a part to play. We're participants in his nature. So how do we do that? Peter told us in chapter 1, verse 13, prepare your minds for action. Uh, chapter 4, verse 1, arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ in regards to suffering. Uh, in chapters four, chapter 4, verses 7 and 8, be clear-minded and self-controlled because your enemy would devour you. Now, Paul follows this same line of thinking when we go to Ephesians 6. And I'd like to turn there now. So open your Bibles, if you would, to Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. Now, these are probably familiar scriptures to you, um, but they were exciting to me, and I want to present them in a little different light. Some of you were around for our Ephesians study. That was back in 2018, and I'm sure with your photographic memories, you remember exactly what you learned, just like I remember exactly what I studied. But it was fun to plunge back into my notes and kind of pull them together for God's word for us for today. Uh, so let's look at that, starting in verse 10. And I'm in the NIV today, so I think it's a little easier for you all to understand and uh, maybe more universal uh, of a translation. But I may pop back and forth because I, I do like the New King James as well. Here's these familiar verses. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in, and in his mighty power. Put on. See, that's what I'm saying. He's exhorting us. There's something we need to do. As Peter was saying, be self-controlled, be alert. Paul here is saying here, put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, here we are, guys, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Wow. Um, uh, Paul starts us right out, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Uh, guys, this is not our power. We are participants in what He has already done for us. We are recipients of His power. And he tells us to put that on, God's full armor. Uh, he's exhorting us to step out, put our faith in action. How do we do that? How can we know we're going to be effective when he says, we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil itself? Satan's goal is not merely to mess with our finances right now in our economy, not even to just mess with our health. 
which is really the scariest thought, I think, for all of us. But he wants us ultimately to lose heart and doubt God's goodness and love in the trial. God's got this. He's in control. Satan would have us, remember he's a deceiver, to believe that God has lost track of all of this. And everywhere we look, it's desolation, just like David in the cave. There didn't appear to be any good outcome. And yes, we are in a suffering place. Uh, the guarantee is not that we're going to come unscathed from this. But the goal is that we are growing our roots down deeper into God, his love for us, his provision, his promises, that we might know him better because he's our only hope. Only he can cause us to dwell in safety. Now, notice in this uh, section about the defensive gear that we're putting on, and it is defensive gear. It's not ours, it's his. We can't defeat evil. I don't know about you, but I don't even stand a chance to think I could defeat Satan. How do we defeat him? We learn by resisting him, as Peter said, standing firm in your faith, submitting to God. And then uh, Paul is taking us the same place here in Ephesians 6. When he says stand, the translation there means maintain your position, hold your ground. He says it three times in verses 13 and 14. So that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then. He says it three times in that section. Now here's what's interesting. Um, a lot of people have taught this, and I heard this most all my life, that Paul has here uh, in mind the Roman soldier putting on all his various gear. And that is a great image. I love that image in my head that we're preparing to arm ourselves for battle. But really... Um, there is a picture here, I think far more, far more likely that the Holy Spirit is trying to make real to us that it's God himself who is the battle dress. Here we're going to draw from almost exclusively Isaiah, but also the Psalms portraying Jesus as the warrior Messiah. Guys, this isn't our battle. This is his, and it's already won. It's already won, but we've got to be reminded. Uh, look at verse 14, and, and I encourage you, grab a pen if you haven't already. The, the beauty of recordings is you can pause me anytime, pick up your pen, uh, fill your coffee cup, and come back, or go back to points that maybe you wished you could hear again. In verse 14, he talks about the belt of truth, and here's where I want to ask you to jot down. I'm going to read the references, but I'd like you to jot them down and look more closely later. I, I, I find they're exciting, and it comes really alive when we read them off the page. Verse 14 says, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist and with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Here's what Isaiah 11, 5 says. Righteousness will be his belt and faithfulness the sash around his waist. His waist. Now, Isaiah 11, 12 are talking about the promise of the coming Messiah and the joy of that day. All through uh, Isaiah, if you're familiar at all with it, has the most prophecies about the coming Christ, the suffering Savior, but the coming Christ, the Redeemer of Israel. The prophet is, is prophesying about what is to come. Ultimately, that's come. We already have this in Christ. Now, verse 14 also says, uh, the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. Now, the first reference I gave you was Isaiah 11, 5. This one is Isaiah 59, 17. And it says this, He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Now, when we get down to verse 17 in Ephesians, we're going to uh, see there he's talking about the helmet of salvation. Isaiah 59, 17 combines that in both verses, uh, both those things in one verse to say, he put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Uh, going on in verse 15. And with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Again, Isaiah 52. Isaiah 52, verses 6 and 7. Says this, It is I who foretold it. Yes, it is I. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. He's talking about Jesus bringing the good news of the gospel to us. Wow, it's his power. It's what's already accomplished. It's what's been foretold. It's what's coming. Verse 16, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Psalm 18, one of my very favorites, and I'm starting in verse one on this that says, the Lord is my shield. Who's your shield? 
What's the shield? The Lord is my shield. He's the horn of my salvation and my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So shall I be saved from my enemies. Wow, it's God who saves me from my enemies. Hang on just a minute. I'm catching up with my notes. Verse 16, finishing, uh, completing that thought. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Now, the flaming arrows, maybe you all have some notes in your Bible, but the flaming arrows would be arrows that they dipped in pitch. And here it says that you can extinguish. We're not just deflecting Satan's arrows with a few good thoughts. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. I'll run away for now, says the devil. No, we are extinguishing them. We are rendering them powerless by what? By the shield of faith. Who is your shield? The Lord is my shield. He's my deliverer, not me not the economy, not the healthcare system. He is my shield. Guys, this is the message of hope. The message that's being portrayed here is what defeats Satan. What is the message? The message is the message of the gospel. Like Peter told us, stand firm in your faith. That's exactly what Paul is telling us here. The message of the gospel is what defeats Satan. We submit to God. We submit to his truth. We resist. He flees. We find that out in Peter and in James, but also we find out here in Ephesians that we render him powerless by what? By the gospel of our salvation. Moving on to verse 17. Take the helmet of salvation, we discussed that one, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Isaiah, again, 49 verse 2 says this. Uh, Isaiah's mouth is full of the word of God like a sharpened sword. As he's speaking, my mouth is like a sharpened sword, full of the word of God. Wow. In verse 18, now we're kind of ending the weapons imagery, but, but here's how Paul conclu concludes this. And pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. That means pour out your heart with this in mind. Be alert and always keep on praying. With this in mind, be alert. How do we stay alert? How do we stay self-controlled? By keeping this in mind. What, Beth, are we keeping in mind exactly? What are we talking about? The gospel message. Now, I want you to think about the gospel message. A lot of us, we think, well, what's the gospel message? Well, I believe that Jesus died for me and forgave me my sins so that I could go to heaven. Well, praise God, that's it, yes. But we need to look a little bit deeper as to what the gospel message is. We gotta think through what it means. We let those words become uh, kind of just a, a, a mantra to us or, or a, a rhetoric and they lose the power because we don't stop and think about what they're talking about. Why did Jesus have to die? Well, because he had to pay for my sins. Why did he have to pay for my sins? Well, there was no other way for God to be in relationship with me. Well, why did God need to be in relationship with me? Well, he didn't need to. He wanted to. He wanted to. God, with his great love wherewith he loved us, what? Came and rescued us from our sins. Why? Because he wanted to be in relationship with us. From the very beginning, from the perfect Garden of Eden, we were created in his image, clothed with glory and honor, Psalm 8 tells us. God loved us. The only way he could express that love where we could enter into relationship with him was through the death of Jesus. Why is that? Because in Genesis 1 and 2, we were in this really perfect place, and what happened? We sinned. Oh, wow, did we surprise God? Absolutely not. He already had the rescue plan in place. He already knew we weren't going to be able to do it. And he set out this whole elaborate plan from Genesis 3 up until Revelation to rescue us, to restore us into relationship with himself. Why? There is no answer, but he wanted to. Why? Because he loved us. Ephesians 1 says he planned before creation. He chose us before creation to be his very own. Now, if that's true, if that's true, then we get a little better picture of what Romans 8 says when he says, nothing can separate us from the love of God through Christ my Lord. Nothing, not trouble, not hardship, not persecution, not famine, lines at the grocery store, danger, a virus, economic fallout. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. What does our conquering mean? 
It means God has already got us through this. This is what Philippians means, uh, Philippians 4, 8 means when it says, whatever things are true, fix your mind on these things. Whatever things are true, fix your mind on these things. The truth of the gospel is what we think on. Now, listen for a minute. Sometimes we think, oh, that's great theology, Beth. That's really great stuff. But right now I'm dealing with the practicalities and I'm really anxious about all this stuff. And if this stuff doesn't change, I just don't know what's going to happen. But we don't live out our faith as the rest of the world lives out our faith. Our hope, like we talked last week, is not in the economy. It's not in the palace, guys. Uh, I would love for things to change. They will. We are going to get through this. But in the meantime, God wants to use this to teach us about himself. And there is no security, but that's not with him. So what do we meditate on? What do we meditate on? This is where Eddie's message from last week, I think, is so good. Because we need to know who God is that he's powerful, that he's loving, and that he's good, that he has this. Guys, there will be tribulation in the world. We're not going to escape trouble. So let your faith become robust. God's word is robust. His truth is robust to hold us up in the middle of the deepest storm, and that's where we are. I, my cat just passed in the background. Did you see that? I just, I just have to point that out. I think that was kind of funny. Uh, anyway, that's what Philippians 4, 8 means when it says, Fix your mind on what is true. Now, the title of what I was teaching you today was The Power of Keeping Our Minds on Gospel Truth. To the degree that we know who God is and we say, Lord, help me to believe this more deeply, I'm scared. We pour out our hearts, just as uh, Paul has told us here, all kinds of prayers. Keep on praying for everybody. All kinds of prayers, all kinds of requests. Uh, and Philippians 8 says, fix your mind, though, on what is true. Now, I want to give you a little exercise. You're getting kind of a, of a twofer here. You're getting a Sunday school lesson, and you're getting free counseling. So uh, look at it that way. Um, there's a balance between expressing our fears and our experiences to God because they're real. We're not diminishing the reality of what's going on here. But we need to call those things that are true. Now, I'm going to hold this up. Hope you see it. Can you see that? It's a little T. That's my reality. That's what's going on right now. That's what I pour out to God. Lord, I'm scared. I don't like this. I'm bored. I'm frustrated. Um, I'm actually kind of apathetic. I don't know. I'm wholly anxious. Uh, all of us are responding maybe a little bit differently. Those are your feelings. That's what we pour out to him. But what do we meditate on? And let me challenge you with this. We meditate on capital T. These are our realities, our truths, our facts, but the capital T, this is God's truth. This is God's truth. This is what we just read. He has this. Do you think from the beginning of time, if God chose to rescue us, to make us his own, to develop a plan to adopt us as his family, not even keep us servants? I've said multiple times, I've been thrilled to be a servant but he wants me in his family because he loves me. If that God who hung the stars in place, read Job, read Psalm 104. If that God wants to be in relationship with me and he can make all that happen, don't you know he can use this for good? And the good he wants to use it for, according to Romans 8, 29, is that we become more and more made in his image, more like Christ. And as we do, guys, it's not just that, oh, we get holy and God likes holy. It's that we become everything he created us to be. Our joy increases, our peace increases, our purpose has more depth. I'm not preaching a feel good, perfect all the time being a Christian. I wake up like you guys every day facing the challenge. Am I going to be grumpy and irritable and worried and control oriented? Or am I going to learn to trust God? And I fail every day. But I know that he is my hope. And that's what I pursue because he's got me and he's got this. He's got this. He loves you. Um, I want to challenge you this week. And I'm going to ask you next time. So you got to do this. I want you to keep track of things. I want you to remember the little T's and the big T's. Last week you had the takeaway. David is, has as much security in the cave as he does in the palace. You have so much, as much security in your cave as you do in the palace of where you were before, right? This is your takeaway for this week. Lord, here's how I'm feeling. Those are my little T facts and experiences. But Lord, they are subjected to the capital T, the truth of who you are. How do you do that? Well, I'm going to give you something to do that I give a lot of my counselees to do. Keep track. On paper, the reason I say do it on paper is because when we write it down, it becomes more part of us. It becomes more deliberate. 
um, we see it better. And then we start creating it. All of a sudden we start kind of doing it on our own without needing to write it down in the paper. But here's what I have people do a lot and I've done myself, it's very effective. I want you to keep track of this week on paper. Make like three columns. In the first column, I want you to write down every time you feel upset. You might be angry, you might be anxious, you might be just frustrated, whatever you're, whatever's going through your mind, I want you to write down that trigger. And then I want to write down what your thoughts are. Remember, this is the power of keeping our minds on gospel truth. Peter and Paul both encouraging us, put that on, stand firm, uh, be alert, be self-controlled, watch out for the Satan who wants to destroy your hope. Write down what your thoughts are. That's going to take some thinking. Uh, play on words, I know, but many times we don't know what we're thinking about. We just know we feel down, we feel a little disheveled. Think about what you're thinking about. For me, I can pretty much tell you, I'm starting to get a little worried if I'm not going to be able to get this or that done. I'm, I'm a worrier by nature. Or, oh my word, what if the stock market really doesn't rebound? What, what might happen then? Write down your thoughts and then challenge those in the last column with God's truth. God's capital T truth. What does God's word say? Pour out your feelings, but meditate on truth. I gave you some truth already in what we studied. And in my notes, I put a yellow highlighter on this. It didn't come up in my printing, so I'm going to have to go through by uh, just by sight and pull it out here. But what kind of hope did we have? Uh, he is righteous. Verse 14, the belt of truth, the belt of righteousness from Isaiah 11. Righteousness will be his belt. He is righteous. He is faithful. He has saved us. He brings us good news, the, the good news of peace. God brings peace to us. He is our shield. Lord, you are my shield. None of this is my shield and my salvation. You alone are my shield, my stronghold, the horn of my salvation. Lord, I can extinguish, literally render powerless Satan's jabs when I know that you do love me. You do have me. And even though I might go through hard times here, you've promised me eternity, and you've promised me a life and life more abundantly while I'm here. But we got to think his way, guys. we got to think the way the Bible teaches us to think. we got to think the way the Spirit leads us to think. Challenge your little T's with the big T truth this week. Guys, this is just living the Christian life. This is how we grow into his likeness. It doesn't matter what the battle is. It's kind of all the same stuff. It's not easy to do, but it's really fairly simple. This is living the Christian life. Whether you're in the cave of coronavirus or the palace of prosperity, we're going to get through, and God's going to bless you and make you more and more what he wants you to be. I'm so glad you've joined me. We'll see you again next week. Bye. Bye.